I'm David Nisbet and I'm a forest pest analyst with the Invasive Species Centre in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Today I'm here with Dr. Taylor Scar of the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and we're out for a walk in the forest to see how many invasive species we can find. Some invasive species such as insects, plants and pathogens can be particularly harmful to Canada's forests. These species can impact the recreational value of forests, forest industry, biodiversity or the ecological services provided by forests such as carbon sequestration or water and nutrient cycling. If we find any of these key invasive species, we'll show you how to report a sighting. Taylor, this looks like a pretty healthy green forest. Is that necessarily the case? It certainly is a green forest, but there are parts of it that we'll find that have been invaded by invasive plants and also in some cases some invasive insects or diseases. So when we're talking about invasive species, um, one of the big issues that we have is invasive species can often outcompete native species. When our goal is trying to grow healthy trees and forests, uh, invasive species can outcompete and cause issues with uh, keeping uh, trees and forests healthy. So what are we looking at here? These are some plants that somebody has dumped right into the forest. So this is yard waste that somebody didn't want anymore and they've taken it from the yard and dumped it right into the forest. So plants get introduced in a couple of ways. One is through the horticulture and landscaping where people buy and plant uh, species that then invade from their yards into the forest. Or sometimes people will take those species and through dumping them, say right here in the forest, they've introduced it directly into the forest ecosystem. So here's a, a dead tree that somebody took from the yard, soil and all, and brought it here and, and just dumped it in the forest. As well as these grasses here, you can see where it came right out of a pot. They dumped it into the forest. And there may be seeds uh, from another invasive species in the soil here, or this plant itself could be invasive and they've dumped it directly into the forest, which allows it to establish and spread. So proper disposal of yard and garden waste is a great way to prevent the spread of invasive plants? Yes, if you want your natural areas to remain natural, it's important that you don't introduce non-native species into those ecosystems. What we're looking at here is a young ash tree that's under attack from emerald ash borer, a non-native beetle that was introduced to North America from China. What we're seeing right here is where woodpeckers have been feeding on the tree. So they come along and they flake the bark off to get at the emerald ash borer larvae that are feeding underneath the bark. The larvae leave serpentine or S-shaped tunnels under the tree, under the bark. And the woodpeckers come along and they poke holes looking for the larvae underneath. And here is an emerald ash borer larva right here. And it's the culprit that's making these S-shaped or serpentine tunnels is feeding just under the bark, and this is the live portion of the tree right here, these cells right here that make the wood and the bark of the tree, and the insect is feeding right there, and that cuts off the flow of nutrients that are the food that's made by the leaves that are transported down to the roots. The roots then can't get food, they die, and then they can't send water up to the top of the tree, and then the top of the tree dies. So this is the larva right here. You notice how white, it's white, and it's flattened with these bell-shaped sections on it, and it feeds just under the bark of the tree. This is the exit hole that's made by the adult emerald ash borer. The hole is about three and a half to four millimeters across. It's shaped like the capital letter D. It's flat on one side and semicircle on the other side. The flat side could be on the upper side or on the underside of the exit hole, and it's always perpendicular to the bark. The larva feeds underneath the bark, it pupates underneath the bark, and then about two weeks later, the pupa changes into an adult beetle that chews its way through the bark. The beetles then emerge, mate and lay their eggs and then attack other ash trees. In particular, uh, emerald ash borer is a very large problem across uh, much of Ontario um, and it's an issue for us in the city of Ottawa. Um, that in particular in, in, in our natural areas is, uh, is a big concern. Um, often we see a concern as well with European buckthorn um, and just with how those two species work uh, we often see them uh, as an issue on the same site. So for example, where we have uh, forested areas with uh, large amounts of ash and buckthorn on the same site, we're often dealing with the results of emerald ash borer and uh, the presence of European buckthorn um, at the same time, uh, which creates challenges for us in order to establish a, a desirable future forest condition. So, Taylor, this plant seems to be dominating the understory here. What are we looking at? David, this plant is buckthorn, and it's an invasive plant that has invaded this site. This is a site of red pine trees that 
are starting to mature and the suppressed trees are, are dropping out of the stand and when they drop out that opens up the canopy and lets more sunlight in and then the buckthorn has moved into the site and you, if you see behind us it's dominating the site other native plants aren't able to grow here and it's now dominated by buckthorn and as it grows up it's going to produce the uh, fruit that then is distributed by birds and spreads it around through the forest you can tell it's buckthorn it has these dark shiny green leaves and then the veins on the leaf come out and they just curve along the, like an arc along the edge of the margin. And then the leaves are uh, spaced on opposite sides of the twig and they're called sub-opposite or opposite because where one uh, leaf comes out just lower on the branch another leaf comes out on the opposite side. So what will this forest look like in a few years? Right now it's dominated by a low shrub layer of, of buckthorn. As the uh, pine trees start to die off some more, it's going to allow more light to come in and the buckthorn is going to continue to grow up and form a dense layer of uh, tall shrubby trees that will completely dominate the site and keep out any native species that might try to invade the site and grow there on their own. Well let's go see what else we can find. Okay. So for woodlot owners we want them to be aware of how to identify invasive species. Uh, early detection is important when we're talking about invasive species so that control measures can be put in place as early as possible uh, and, and early intervention would have the most uh, chance of success. Uh, we also want uh, woodlot owners to be aware uh, that a healthy and diverse forest will be most resistant and resilient to any invasions from invasive species. Uh, so a healthy and diverse forest is, is the goal. Um, and uh, woodlawn owners can talk to forestry professionals about how to achieve that. This is a butternut tree. This is a native tree that is being attacked by a fungus called butternut canker. It's an introduced or invasive fungus that is attacking just about every butternut in the province of Ontario. In the natural range of butternut, almost every tree has some level of infection from this fungus. And it causes these cankers or dead portions on the bark of the tree. And underneath this black area, the bark is dead and when you get so many of these cankers that they coalesce and kill large sections of the bark eventually they can kill the whole tree. It can take a few years for the tree to die but eventually the tree will die. Uh, so many of these butternuts are infected and dying in Ontario that a butternut tree is now on the endangered species list and there is a recovery plan trying to promote and protect this tree to keep it in the forest landscape in the province. This is dog strangling vine. And you can see it's growing right up here as a, as a vine. Uh, they can reach up to two meters tall or even taller. And it grows in these dense patches like this and it completely dominates the site. Uh, it's called dog strangling vine. Uh, no reports of it actually strangling a dog, but it's at the right height and dense enough that you can imagine the difficulty of a dog or any wildlife or even us trying to get through a thicket of dog strangling vine. It has these uh, narrow leaves on it that particularly at the base, they're narrow and coming to a point um, and these pods here are the seed pods. So it's related to milkweed, which also has pods, but these ones are quite narrow, usually in pairs. And inside would be a seed with a white tuft on it. And like milkweed seeds, those can blow on the wind and be transported to new areas. But it also grows up from the roots and the roots produce a chemical that inhibits the growth of other plants around it and that allows it to dominate the site. So I found a patch of garlic mustard here. Garlic mustard is a biennial plant species, so the first year will be a low ground cover plant that looks like this, and by the second year it's grown taller and produces seeds. So this garlic mustard has been flowering and has gone to seed. You can see the seed pods at the top here. Um, and it's only the second year plants that produce the seed pods. An easy way to remember uh, the name garlic mustard is that if you rip off a leaf and crush it up, it actually has a garlicky smell. Control of garlic mustard can be done by hand. You can simply pull the plants out of the ground. But if you are going to control for garlic mustard, make sure you do it early in the summer before the plant has gone to seed. So for this plant, it's too late. It's already gone to seed and pulling it out of the ground won't stop it from coming back but if you pull it earlier in the summer, so in May or June when it's still flowering, then that's a lot more effective. One of the things that we uh, first need to think about is early detection. Uh, so when invasive species are first becoming established on a site or coming into an area, we wanna know about those. 
Um, once we have that kind of information, we want to put a plan in place. Uh, often our plans are site specific, um, but we want to make sure we understand the species uh, that we're dealing with, the invasive species that we're dealing with, how it works, and uh, what we can do to possibly manage it. As you can see, a seemingly healthy forest could be filled with a number of harmful invasive insects, plants, or pathogens. If you do see an invasive species, please report the sighting. Invasive species sightings can be reported to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, your Provincial Ministry of Natural Resources, or if you're in Ontario, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters Invading Species Hotline, or EDMAPS, that's E-D-D MAPS, website or phone app. When you're leaving a site where you know invasive species exist, please make sure to clean off your boots, your clothing, your pets, and your friends as you might be carrying hitchhiking invasive species out of the site.